Good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you to all of you who are tuning in from around the world. And welcome, a warm, warm welcome to all of you who have joined us tonight for Eva de Jong, Eva de Jong Duldig's talk, From Vienna to Victoria, Escape and Survival Through Art. This talk is part of the Hong Kong Holocaust and Tolerance Center's Genocide Awareness Month series. The Hong Kong Holocaust Tolerance Center was founded in 2011 and is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to advancing Holocaust education and promoting tolerance. It organizes conferences, workshops, exhibits, and remembrance events that use the lessons of history to prevent anti-Semitism, discrimination, and genocide, and it also works towards advancing tolerance and understanding in our communities. Its school programs have reached approximately 10,000 students per year at more than 50 international and local schools, as well as universities and community colleges. I would also like to warmly acknowledge the support of the Fritz Asher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized and Banned Art which tells untold stories of artists marginalized and persecuted by the German Nazi regime between 1933 and 1945. Thank you very much for your support. My name is Noit Banai, and I'm an art historian working on Jewish artist refugees who fled from Europe to Asia. I currently serve as Associate Professor of Art and Theory at Hong Kong Baptist University. Last June, while studying the Duldig's artistic journey, I was warmly and generously welcomed by Eva de Jong Duldig and her dedicated team at the Duldig studio in the leafy suburb of East Malvern in Melbourne. And I'm so happy to see her again tonight and to be able to introduce her and to moderate this talk. Eva de Jong Duldig is the founder and patron of the Duldig Studio Museum and Sculpture Garden, a public museum dedicated to the preservation and conservation of the Duldig family heritage, which you will hear about tonight. As the founding director of the Duldig Studio, she initiated many public programs, including the annual Duldig Lecture on Sculpture with the National Gallery of Victoria and the Clay for Kids School Workshops. With support from the Austrian government, she organized the Karl Duldig Centenary Exhibition, which toured to Vienna, Krakow, and Melbourne in 2003. In 2017, her family memoir, Driftwood, Escape and Survival Through Art, received a Victorian Community History Award. And in 2021, this book, this remarkable book, was adapted for a staged musical. Eva has worked as a teacher, recreation consultant, playground designer, and freelance writer. She was also chair of the Public Art Committee of the National Trust in Victoria and has contributed to a number of other community art organizations. Eva continues inspiring creative journeys through her ongoing patronage of the Duldig Studio and her community involvement. And we are now about to finally turn to her talk, which is the reason why you've all joined us tonight. And as Eva presents uh, her family history, I would like to warmly invite the public to type any questions that you may have in the chat function below in this uh, in, in Zoom. You can do so at any point during the talk so that I can pose your questions directly to Eva during the Q&A session. So please direct all your questions directly to me in the chat, okay? I need to get your questions so that I could pose them. All your questions come to me. Thank you very much. At the end of the talk, we will have a Q&A session so you will be able to um, hear anything or ask anything also that uh, you may wish to. So without further ado, please join me very, very warmly in welcoming Eva de Jong Duldig to uh, this platform. And the floor is now yours, Eva. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Norit. 
and many thanks to the Hong Kong uh, Holocaust and Tolerance Centre for inviting me to speak today. And thank you to all of you people who've joined to listen, and I hope you will enjoy what I have to say. Um, the book, um, the book which Noad was talking about, Driftwood, Escape and Survival Through Art, and just press down now. Yeah, okay. Um, was written in 2017, but um, when I have been asked how long it took to actually write, that is to think and to all go into my head and to go out of my head and to find the right voice, um, my husband said it took me 45 years, and it was something like that. So it was very difficult because it's telling not, not my story, it's telling my parents' story, and there were so many things I didn't know. Of course, I was given a, a great start in this because my mother was the most amazing archivist, and in the Daldig studio, in our archive, in our collection, there are many, many documents which she saved, which come way back from Vienna in the 1920s even. So all those documents really have formed the basis of this book, which um, I had to put together like a jigsaw puzzle in the end. The book tells our story, but there are two particular strands that it actually, I think, tries to concentrate on. And that is, on the in the first instance, the story of the family, but also the way the the actual fortuitous circumstances that enabled us to survive in the first instance during the Second World War. And the second strand which seeps its way through this story is how not only we survived, which was in itself a kind of a miracle, the way it turned out, but also every single item that was ever in our apartment in Vienna in 1938 also survived. And we didn't take anything with us, and yet it is here now in the Dulwich studio in Melbourne for the public to see and to learn from. And I think that actually in itself is an amazing um, recovery from the circumstances of the Holocaust because it gives a whole broad background to how my family, as an example of many, many other families, lived in Europe before they were, before they were forced to flee. Now, the story it goes back, of course, much further than this, but let's just start in 1911 or so in a, a town called Przemysl in Poland, in eastern, eastern Poland, very near the, the Ukraine border. And there my, my, my father's family, my paternal family lived uh, before the First World War. And here you can see the parents, Adela and Marcus Daldig. And then on the left, my uncle Leo, and standing, my uncle Ignaz, and the little boy is my father, Carl. They lived, as I said, in this city called Przemysl, and the house which you see flat bang in front of you on this image is the house my grandparents built in the middle of Przemysl. And as you can see, it's surrounded by all these churches and everybody in this city lived, lived ha well, happily, at least tolerantly with each other. Um, and uh, I uh, want the, to raise that point because um, I do want to compliment the Hong Kong Tolerance Centre for all the work they do uh, in this context. And I hope that this talk will help you in your work as well. I've just deviated a little bit from there. Um, yes, so this house is still standing in Przemysl and um, I went to visit it one time and uh, I was quite amazed and very moving to walk into the house and feel the tiles that my father must have felt when he was a little boy in this city. Here he is, uh, Karl Duldig at about 19 years old. He was tall and slim, and as you can see, very good looking. 
and he was an outstanding sportsman and also a wonderful artist. And it was very difficult for him to choose what to do and how to live his life as a young man. About my mother now. Here, my mother sitting with her siblings, Marek, her brother, and Oreli. Uh, she was called Rella by the family. And here they are in Lvov. And they were living in Lvov also before the First World War. Uh, till the First World War, let's say they moved not long before the First World War to Vienna. Both the families moved to Vienna, but neither family knew each other then. Slava was an outstanding artist, but she was also a musician and could speak seven languages. And here, as a young girl, she's painting on plein air. And this is her work when she was studying at the Viennese School for Women and Girls. And the woman is a, a, a subject for the students. This work, you can see this work at the museum. And it's a wonderful, wonderful rendition. And uh, when the family ha ha hung it in their house uh, at home in Vienna, the people used to come into the house and say, oh, who painted that old master bath, uh, the masterwork of, of this, uh, who's the artist, they asked. So my parents met when they were students at the Kunstgewerbeschule under Anton Hanak. Um, Hanak is the oldest person in this photo. He's sitting there almost uh, a third from the right. My mother is in the center with a, a something on her head. Um, she was always wearing a hat, a scarf, a bandana. And my father sitting in the foreground on the stone on the left. And we know who each of these students were. As you can see, um, I, I think it's half the class were women and a large number of them were also Jewish. And they're sitting in Hanak's studio in the Prater, um, in the uh, studios which he was given to work in. And those sculptures are his sculptures at the time. My father was carving in stone under Anton Hanak. Hanak was the most amazing teacher. And this work, Math, in Salzburg marble, which is an extremely hard material and very difficult to carve in, was exhibited, was actually representing the school, the Kunstgewerbe Schule, at an international exhibition in Munich in 1921, soon after it was finished. Now, my father was 19 years old when he carved this sculpture, and Hanak used to say he is the best sculptor he's ever come across in Austria for 50 years. My mother's principal claim to fame is that at the time when both my parents went to the academy to study, but my mother was also busy uh, inventing the foldable umbrella. She and my father used to go to the museums and they used to sketch there. And uh, one day it was raining and she writes about it. Uh, I'll just read you a short excerpt. Um, while I was studying at the Academy of Fine Arts, I often went to draw in the Kunsthistorisches Museum Vienna. At that time, I met the sculptor Karl Dordig. It happened one May morning, a cold and rainy day. I armed myself with a big umbrella and muttered to myself, why on earth must I carry this utterly clumsy thing? Can't they invent a small folding umbrella? which could be easily carried in a bag, and she did. So the invention um, was patented and it was also uh, marketed, and my mother received royalties for her patent and for her work uh, with the umbrella for the next nearly 10 years till 1938, which of course is the key year in this story. There are my parents in Vienna, my mother proudly carrying her little umbrella. My parents married in 1931 in a synagogue in Vienna, and um, they were working happily there 
through happily. It was a difficult time. It was post-war and the economy was bad. But in real terms, for my parents, life did have uh, opportunities and my father also was had commissions in his work so they were living peacefully let us say in Vienna. Here my mother is sitting in uh, the living room in the apartment in Vienna and just look at that furniture and keep it in your mind because later on in this in this presentation you will see it again. And she's looking very proud, not only because she's contented and in her work and in her life, but because she also designed the furniture. It was made by a very fine art house furniture uh, designers in Vienna called Sigmund Jare. But my mother was instrumental in the design of this furniture. And take a look at that lamp. You will also see it again later. But... We come to, uh, of course, the the terrible time uh, when Hitler came into Vienna. I was born on the 11th of February, 1938, and exactly one month later, Hitler's army, Hitler marched into Vienna. And what always shocks me when I see this image and others like it is how this massive crowd of people welcomed the Führer, the leader, as they called him. And um, it's it's just, to me, quite unbelievable how the majority of the Austrian people um, didn't fall under spell. They just welcomed him, even though they, the community, the Jewish community in Vienna at the time was 10% of Vienna, about 250,000 people. And yet the majority of the Viennese were pro-Nazi. It, of course, was devastating for the Jewish people, as we all know, and I don't want to go into all the details because you get them very uh, literally described in many other papers, journals, pictures, everything else you see. But um, for a while, my parents actually didn't really do anything and it was only a circumstance, which a bizarre circumstance, uh, which occurred with my father uh, through a game of tennis. And he always said, a game of tennis saved my life. And the chapter nine in my book tells you that story. Uh, but literally, it was a final game of tennis through his sport that he got out of Vienna very quickly, quite suddenly, had to leave and he was able to go to Switzerland, leaving my mother and I in Vienna. And I'm uh, just a few months old, and this is the last photo taken in Vienna of my mother and her sister, Rella, my mother on the left. And if you look down on the bottom right-hand corner of the picture, there's a pram, and in that pram is me. So... My father in Switzerland on his own, my mother and I in Vienna on a desperate, not having any papers to get out at all. And then fortuitously, my father meets an immigration official in Zug in Switzerland where he was living. And this is the gentleman concerned. His name was Ernst Speck. And I always try to include him in this story because literally he saved my life. Um, my father, he advised my father, send your um, wife a note to say she should send her passport to me here in, in Switzerland and I'll endorse it with a return visa. And on those papers, your wife and, her, and your baby will be able to leave Austria and enter Switzerland. And literally that's what happened. And I believe afterwards I did uh, get in touch with the son of this man and I believe he was instrumental in saving not only our lives, but a number of other refugees who were trying to escape into Switzerland at the time. So what happened to us? We couldn't stay in Switzerland. It was really um, a, an interim stop, as my mother called it a hit, hit, in the baby diary, which she wrote. She wrote, Switzerland was just an interlude, and it was. Uh, we couldn't get a residency there, 
we had to find somewhere else to to go. And it, as as you most of you realize, it was almost impossible to enter other countries. Um, however, as it happened, my father's niece, uh, who was married to a Belgian um, from the Gutworth family, they had business interests in in Singapore. And they, she and her husband went to re lead these interests in Singapore. So Ina Gutworth was living in Singapore and she sent a telegram to my father, come to Singapore. And virtually on the basis of that telegram, my father, mother and I sailed to, Swift, to Singapore in early 1939. Now, we would have had to go on to Shanghai if my father had not been able to demonstrate that he could earn a living for himself. However, surprisingly enough, he was able very quickly to get work and his first commission was for the Sultan of Johor. And it is a cenotaph, as you can see on the right, uh, for, the, for the Sultan's daughter who died at a very young age. And on the left, you can see actually my father in the white shorts helping the, the laborers to move the massive granite boulder that he was going to use to carve this uh, cenotaph. Uh, so he was always hands-on in everything that he did. And uh, these people worked for him and he carved this cenotaph. That was his first work in Singapore. I have actually in this talk tried, in the images I've chosen, I've tried to make a larger selection and a more um, a complete coverage of the Singapore period because I feel that many of you are of in, interested in this period and so I have concentrated a little on that and therefore you'll see a, quite a number of these images taken in Singapore. So my father was interested in everybody. He found Singapore absolutely something different, something new, something inspiring, the people, the colour, all these different races. And he was always picking people up from the street. And for instance, um, the coolie, as you can see, he's done a drawing there on the left of the, of the uh, rickshaw driver. And the coolies used to sit on the edges of the road. And he asked one of these coolies who drove the rickshaws to come and sit for him. And so the portrait on the right is of a coolie in Singapore, and it was later acquired by the Raffles Museum in Singapore. Then my father had got another break. Uh, a friend of his, he met a friend at the local tennis club, and he, this man's name, he was an Italian sculptor called Norley, and he invited my father to, to come and work in his studio in Singapore, which was very kind of him. And in that studio, my father actually modelled the portrait of the Malay boy. And here you can see him modelling this young Malayan boy. And, and he's actively working on this boy. Now, um, this, this boy, this Malayan boy, he was a ball boy at the tennis courts. And so again, Carl picked him up and said, oh, would you mind coming to sit for me? And here he is standing. And um, my father just obviously has done this, this absolutely amazing portrait. But it was also written up in the major journal in the Straits Times in 1939 here. A refugee sculptor models first heads in Singapore. The journalist is an Australian and he writes quite beautifully in this article, which you can read in more detail in Driftwood. But my father had a, quite a lot of publicity right away. And then immediately this was followed by work. So he was able to earn a living completely from his art, which was not something he'd been able to do in Vienna. And actually for the only time, you could say till perhaps here later on in his life when he became known in Australia. But it was really the only time, these 15 short months in Singapore was the only time my father was able to earn a living from his sculpture. And here's the Malay boy. Now it has a quite extraordinary uh, history. This is the bronze 
photo of the Malay boy after it was completed. My father had an exhibition in Singapore, and one of the visitors to that exhibition was a young man called Robert Payne, who was the son of the Admiral of the British Fleet in Singapore. And Robert Payne was so impressed with Carl's work that he set aside part of his wages every month to buy a sculpture from Carl, and he commissioned this bronze head of the Malay boy. Now, when um, the Singapore fell to the Japanese or was about to fall, Robert had to flee, and he took the Malay boy in his car with the uh, in Indian driver who was driving him out of Singapore, and he decided that he would give the man the Malay boy. Now, we didn't know any of this, of course, till much later, but um, in 2009, I got an email saying, um, with a photo of the Malay boy and my father's signature, that this, this portrait on the side. And uh, it turned out that the portrait had survived right through from the time 1942, when it was given to this Indian, the, the person, the Joseph had kept, the driver had kept the portrait right through, handed it down to his family, and the family were now looking for, for, for more information. And this portrait now has been acquired by the National Gallery in Singapore. So it has a whole history. We were very lucky in Singapore. We lived on the top floor of this amazing Malayan bungalow. And I, my playmate was a little Chinese boy who lived in the apartment on the ground floor. My father, through his art, made some amazing friends. Here on in this image, we have a photo of Carl with Yu Da Fu. Yu Da Fu was a leading Chinese um, writer, and he had escaped from, from China when the Japanese came into China, and he was a, a Chinese nationalist writer, and he was actually living in Singapore at the same time as we were, and he was very interested in my father's work. And next to him, the monk Guang Kuai, who I believe I found out much later was living till well into the 20, almost into the 20th, first century. And he uh, became very, very famous in Singapore. Uh, he visited, he was introduced to my father by Yu Da Fu, and he came to sit for Carl. Now, the drawing is of the monk, and the monk has written the calligraphy in which he describes how he came to sit for Carl, and he also dedicates a poem to him in his beautiful Chinese calligraphy. It was a kind of a marriage of East and West, quite extraordinary time, and I am the little person there in the front. Of course, I don't remember any of this, but it's all come through through the do many documents and drawings and art and photos we have. This is the, the famous, on the right, the famous O Run Ho, the founder of the Tiger Balm ointment. Uh, the family had come to Singapore well before the Second World War and established their business there. And as I think nearly everyone will know, a Tiger Balm is still one of the most used uh, ointments or uh, medications, uh, popular medications in not only in Asia, but probably around the world today. On the left is um, Obun Pan. Now, the two brothers, the, the all brothers, they, these, these sculptures, these life-size sculptures were commissioned by Obun Ho from my father in 1940 in Singapore. And these are the plaster works which he completed. He never saw the bronze himself. The commission was for two bronze sculptures. And it was the most amazing thing for a sculptor to have a major commission like this. But life takes strange turns. And just simultaneously, almost, with my father getting this amazing commission, we received notice that um, we would have to leave Singapore. 
and uh, the notice came from the Jewish Relief Society and they said within three weeks we would have to be uh, taken away from the island and we were not told where we were going, but we would be sent out of the country. So what happened to these sculptures? They were um, sent to the foundry, Wagstaff, and they were cast, but my father never saw this cast till 1957. And here in Hong Kong, in the Tiger Balm Gardens, where many of you are who are watching this, this webinar today, was the final sculpture, the, the bronze sculpture of Auburn Hall. And my parents only found out because some friends had traveled via Hong Kong to Europe and they'd taken some slides and they showed these slides to my parents and my mother said, oh, look up right there, the sculpture of Auburn Hall. And it was only in 1968 that they were able to see this sculpture themselves. Now, you, those of you who live in Hong Kong will also know that the Tiger Balm Gardens have since been demolished and Sally Hill, the daughter of Auburn Hall, removed the sculpture and it now is in Fujian province in the ancestral uh, village or town where the Orr family came from. So it is still there if you all want to go and see it. Well, what happened to us? Um, my, my parents and I were taken um, as we were called in Mieres because we had German and Austrian uh, papers and we um, were, were at that stage refugees, but this was not recognised by the British who were then the governing authority over the straight settlements. And all German, Austrian, Italian refugees uh, who were living in Singapore at that time were interned and we were collected and taken to St. John's Island and we were placed on the Queen Mary, as it happens at that point in time, it, was, it had been converted to a troop carrier and it stopped in Singapore uh, for repairs and picked us up and took us to Australia. And that is how I, as a little two-year-old, entered this country, Australia. And here we are in the internment camp in Tatura, near in, in central Victoria, uh, in the middle of nowhere, uh, my father, mother and I, and that's our hut in the background. And as you can see, even under these circumstances, my father was determined to work and he even displayed the few little pieces of sculpture he could bring with him from Singapore outside our hut. And he created a life-size figure in eucalypt with an ax, which we see in the next drawing. Um, oh, there's a whole story about how he got permission to go out of the camp and actually get um, a, a big log, which he then carved with an ax into a mother and child figure. And then the children, it was a focal point in the camp and, and us little children used to dance ring a ring a rosy around this sculpture. Um, unfortunately, it didn't survive um, because when we were eventually released from the camp, um, the next group of inmates destroyed it and cut it up for firewood. So it was rather a sad way for the wonderful sculpture to end. So we then are in, um, in this camp, um, and how do we get out of the camp? Because the war is on, and it's, uh, it, no one knew how long the war would take. Uh, it, was, it was not something that we knew anything about. We'd lost contact with all the friends and all the family and everybody else, and uh, we were just stuck. But circumstances, again, came to our assistance as they had really by bringing us to this country. Um, I'll just backtrack a little bit. I mean, imagine if we had been left in Singapore in 1940 and the Japanese, as you well know, uh, overran Singapore in 1942. So uh, in a way, 
I do believe that our lives were saved twice, not only in Vienna through the amazing circumstances of my father playing a last game of tennis, but also in Singapore where we got out just before the Japanese invasion. Just sheer luck because we didn't want to leave Singapore. My father and my parents loved Singapore and they tried everything they could to stay there, but it didn't work. And so then we were stuck in the camp uh, for how long? Well, um, the war took other turns and uh, Pearl Harbor fell and the Australians were very short of manpower and they needed people on the home front who could just keep things going, who could move the railways, who could go to the ships and unload, who could do all kinds of other labour-intensive jobs because all the young men, the Australian men, were overseas fighting in the Second World War, either on the, the European front or against the Japanese in north of Australia. But once Pearl Harbour fell, everything changed and people began to look Oh, we've got all these refugees who, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're not Nazis, but they're interned. Now we can let them out and, we can, and they can help us to work on the home front. And that's exactly what happened. They formed an employment company called the Eighth Employment Company in, um, in Melbourne. And the refugee people in the camps because we, of course, were in a large camp with many other refugees, they could join up and enlist and leave the camp and become soldiers. And at the same time, the families in our case, because we were among 250 other family, 250 other people from Singapore, we could come down to Melbourne and be free. And here my father in his uniform, my mother in her smart Viennese costume, as she called it, and me, I'm aged four here when we're in a boarding house in Melbourne, in our first house in Melbourne. Well, my father didn't stay long in the army. He was able to get, um, uh, uh, be able to be discharged for medical reasons. And he then took up other positions in Melbourne. And uh, after the war, my parents became art teachers at uh, schools in Melbourne. Uh, and at the same time, they found out, of course, during that during the war, nearly all their families had been exterminated, annihilated in Poland and in Europe. Those those members of the family who had remained in Europe, the families in Przemysl, my uncle Ignaz, my grandmother Adela, uh, Ignaz's wife, were killed in Chemisil, and the whole horror of his family, all my mother's family, disappeared. The only person to survive out of her whole family, which was a very large family, her name was Slava Horowitz, um, and she was a, came from a very large family, the only person to survive was her sister, Rella, and she married a Frenchman, and she was living in Paris. Now, I'm said to you that uh, you remember that furniture, photo of the furniture way back and the lamb. Well, my aunt managed to, through my mother's, I suppose, uh, well, she was just amazing, my mother in Vienna. She packed everything in Vienna and she um, got it to a, 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 a storage place. And from there, my aunt, because she was French because she married a Frenchman. She was able to take everything that was in our apartment in a huge consignment to Paris. And she and her husband, during the Nazi occupation of Paris, which was at risk to their lives, hid everything in the cellar of their apartment house in Paris. Well, after the war, my mother finally made contact with her sister in Rella, which was just a most amazing emotional event when she received a little card saying, uh, Aurélie and Marcel est née, uh, 19 Rue Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Paris 1. 
And then she found out, my mother found out, and my parents found out that everything that had been in the apartment in Vienna had been saved. Now, I've got this, this list up because it is part of a six-page list of items that my aunt wrote at 19, in 1946 when she shipped everything out to Australia back to my family. And we were living at that point in a flat in Ackland Street, St Kilda, and one day I came home from school and the whole flat was full of things that I'd never seen before in my life. So it was all very exciting and quite amazing. And, um, of course, it made me begin to think about these things about my past. So my parents re-established their art careers as well, particularly my father with his sculpture. Um, this sculpture in 1956 won the Victorian Sculpture of the Year Award for my father. Um, he's, he's a, uh, those of you who can't recognise what it is, it is the moment in Exodus when Moses comes down from Mount Sinai and smashes the tablets of the law because he's so angry that the Jewish people are wor worshipping the golden calf. Um, so um, it, it was... I think it says um, survival through art, escape and survival through art. It was really through art that my parents were able to kind of find themselves again. They taught art. My father worked in art. Their artistic mentality meant that they could overcome the emotions and the trauma of their, of their terrible losses. Um, more perhaps than many other people could because they had this great gift of creativity. And uh, I grew up actually very fortunately because it was the, the, the burden of the Holocaust was never put on me. I never really knew anything about it. The first time I knew about it was when I was an adult and that enabled me to grow up free of uh, these kinds of burdens, which can be quite devastating to young people. So what did I do? Um, I, I studied, I was at university, but I also was an outstanding tennis player. And at one point, here I am playing at Wimbledon. Um, that's, uh, I'm playing with a South African girl called Marlene Gerson, and she's a Jewish girl. And we probably are the only Jewish players to ever reach the quarterfinal as a doubles combination at Wimbledon. Um, and the article on the right talks about me playing the third round of the singles against the eventual winner in uh, Wimbledon that particular year, 1961. Uh, and that was published in our major newspaper, The Herald. My father, in the meantime, uh, continued to uh, do his his work and in 1968 or a bit earlier really this photo was taken in 1968 but he was commissioned by the Hakoa Wien, Hakoa Sports Club Wien, that is the people who used to belong to the Hakoa Sports Club in Vienna which was a major sports sporting association their football team had at one stage won the Austrian League and my father was a goalkeeper for this particular club. And uh, when they wanted to have a memorial for the Holocaust and they wanted to erect it in Israel, they commissioned my father to do this, to actually make this monument, to build this wonderful monument and to uh, uh, model this marvellous figure for the sculpture in Israel to commemorate the sportsmen who lost their lives in the Holocaust. And the figure is called Dawn, and it's a new dawn for the Jewish people and for Israel, built on the fragments and the devastation. The, the symbolism of the stones is that they symbolize the des destruction of Jewry in Europe and the rebuilding of a new Jewish homeland in Israel. Now, the photo on the right, I love. It, my parents are really, you can't see them very well here, but they're right in the centre, right in the front. 
and her mother in the wonderful white dress she designed and uh, wore proudly and figure at the back. And these hundreds of people who came from around the world, still the survivors who, who had escaped, but who came to, to this commemoration in Israel in 1968, which coincided with the 20th anniversary of the, of the establishment of the state of Israel as well. Now, my mother uh, and her sister, there was this enormous bond between them. Um, I, I, the way I understand it, even as children, you know, they were really close to each other. And they grew up very closely. And when my mother was studying, um, uh, Bella, her sister, used to, used to come and spend time with my mother's friends at the academy and at the Kunske Vavishul and all the artists. She was part of the artist clique. And Rella was a wonderfully beautiful woman, but also an actress, very gifted. And then this enormous separation from one side of the world to the other. I really can't imagine. For years and years and years, I wanted them to come as a child. I wished they would come. And my mother, of course, would have just given anything to have a sister with her. But somehow or other, it didn't work out. And for 30 years, my mother and her sister exchanged letters from one side of the world to the other. And then... As part of the journey my parents made to Israel for the opening, for the unveiling of the monument to the Hakoa Fallen, they also went to Paris. And this photo shows my mother and her sister in Paris. It's actually taken in Montmartre by my father. And uh, they met only for a few weeks, only one more time in their lives. And I still think that is such a sad uh, thing to happen, of course, and there are many, it happened to many families and often much worse than that. Let's take a sip of water. So um, the story of my parents, as I said, now resides in the Daldick Studio. And this is a photo of the Daldick Studio in Melbourne. Uh, it is our old family home in which we lived. I, we moved into the house in 1955 and um, my parents uh, lived and worked there. My mother continued to teach privately as well as at the schools. And she, um, uh, we've just published a book on her called Slava Horovitz Daldig. The Daldig Studio published this book which tells her complete story, which is just quite amazing. And this museum now is a, pub, it is a public museum established in 2002. It's um, open to them, as Noah has been to visit, so she knows. But um, for those of you who ever come to Melbourne, well, it's a must-see. Um, you will see the furniture and the works of art that were saved in Vienna and, of course, many other items that were also made here. There's, there's another bronze cast of the Moses, but all those stones, in stone carvings in this particular photo, they were saved from the apartment in Vienna and they are here now in the museum in my father's original studio set up entirely the way he had it. And here is the sitting room. And I, I must apologize because in this particular photo of the lovely Viennese furniture, which is now here in Melbourne, and the lamp is not in this particular photo, the one in the other photo. Um, and But uh, the, you can see the, the color here of the red leather uh, strapping or lattice work, which my mother designed in this particular um, room. And so I don't know how long that has all taken. It seems to be 54 minutes or something. And I'm sure that um, I hope that I haven't jumped too much for you, but I didn't want to read. I wanted to speak. And I hope that I can answer your questions. I know it. So I'm, I'm uh, please fire away. 
<laughs> Thank you so very, very, very much, Eva, for that wonderful uh, tribute to your parents, uh, a tribute to uh, the world of yesterday, as Stefan Zweig called it, and a tribute to art and survival through art. Uh, an extraordinary story, really. And before I ask questions, uh, I would also like to invite the public to uh, ask any questions that they have by um, typing in the chat and directing those questions to me. And I'll be happy to pose your questions to Eva. So thank you once again. Um, my question, you know, is actually about art because you mentioned so beautifully that it's really that creative spirit or creative uh, worldview or problem solving or whatever you'd like to call it, attitude, sentiment, that helped your parents get through many, many traumas and difficult moments. And I'm wondering, as they moved from Vienna or fled uh, from Vienna to Singapore, to Tatura, to Melbourne, what also changed, let's say, in their artwork? What mm. was the impact of the various places that were their harbor or their ports or their camps? How did that also impact their art? Yes, well, it's a wonderful question. Thank you, Norwich. It particularly applies to my father. My mother found that having to manage the family and having to work and having to administer and having to promote my father's work and all the rest of it, she had much, she couldn't actually have the peace of mind to actually concentrate on her own art once she arrived in this country. But let's take my father as an example. He was, uh, I think you might recall the drawing of the, uh, of the uh, monk of the Buddhist of the monk in Singapore. Now there, he used an Indian ink, a quill pen, and a Chinese brush. He immediately was able to adopt the circumstances and the art, the things around him that kind of were already being used by others around him, and applied them in his own work. Even the drawing of the um, rickshaw boy the same sort of thing. You know, he got the inspiration from seeing this scene in front of him and was able to apply it. The one constant that I would say where this perhaps applies slightly less is that he kept working in on his portraits, but even they, they changed too because in Vienna he was doing portraits in marble. In after once he arrived in Singapore, he began to work much more in clay, and in Australia, he also worked in clay. So there's a big difference between working in clay and working in stone and in bronze. And every time he adapted according to the circumstances that were around him. The other big example, perhaps, is the one of bringing that eucalypt log in. From, the camp, from outside the camp in Tatura and carving it with an axe inside because he had no other tools and he had nothing to work with except what was around him and what was around him were the eucalypt logs and the eucalypt firewood and it is in those materials that he actually worked. Now, that changed his work and he knew it was changing his work. He was always somehow able to change his mode of working, his subject, the, particularly the materials, I think was a big thing. And just the environment. We have a property, we had a little property down the peninsula and he was always finding things there that inspired him. Does that answer your question a bit? Yes, absolutely. I mean, he was uh, shaped by the art and shaping the art and uh, using everything in sight as a kind of, uh, everything was cross-pollinating each other. Yes, what that's it sounds right. like. Mm. And it sounds like for your mother, um, for Slava, I mean, you were mentioning the incredible um, work that she was doing supporting Carl and also teaching and um, all the other you know, aspects uh, that she was taking care of, of the home. And it strikes me that this Viennese interior, right? This Viennese interior um, that, they, that 
that reappears reappears much later on in a way is part of could would it be fair to call it part of a kind of artwork that yes. defines a new life as well and mm. um, my mother was perhaps even more uh, how would I put it contemporary I don't want to use the word modern but she moved very much with the times in her art and in Vienna she had the opportunity to do do this design work for her own apartment and she took it and so she designed furniture she also did some graphic design and then don't forget in Vienna she designed and invented the first foldable umbrella so you know this was then at that time that was there but throughout her later life she also was adapting uh, her teaching work according to it's inspired by You know by perhaps even what had happened to her she went to this school in Vienna for women and girls well they taught everything there all kinds of graphic work and all kinds of other artistic mediums and she applied a lot of this almost craft work to the way she taught at her school um I, I think my mother in a way was well not not in a way she she held the family together there's absolutely no question of that. She, she was the first one to get a teaching position here which she held right through till she retired and uh, she definitely kept my father on track and uh, was a wonderful person to have to lead our family and uh, as a follow-up question and maybe so for our, our public I mean I read your book but for those who haven't what happened to the umbrella what happened to the to the rights? Uh-huh. <laughs> yes, I didn't go into that, did I? Well, uh, when my mother, as I mentioned, got royalties till 1938, and then when we were already in Switzerland, she received a uh, notification from her manufacturer from Bruda Vista, and they asked her to sign off all her rights, all her patent rights to them. The letter was signed Heil Hitler. And of course, we were fleeing. There was no way she could fight this. And they offered her a thousand Reichmarks. And so she sold all her rights to this wonderful invention and never saw another penny again. And um, I, I, you know, when, when we're in the museum, we say, yes, well, if we uh, had still the rights to that umbrella, we would have... more than enough sustainable funds to look after this museum <laughs> because the, of course the foldable umbrella is just ubiquitous all over the world but if she was ahead of her time right she was very she was... much so yes as a young person she actually took a lead in the in getting the patent in writing the documents the contracts with the manufacturer in making sure that That she received royalties I have we have uh, in the museum the documents which she has annotated where she has said uh, you know how she wants this to be the rights to be paid to her and so on thank you I and have she, a and she, oh, she kept all these documents too it's really through her that we have the museum because she kept everything it's absolutely incredible that Uh, when you you know recognize that all of these documents all of these artworks all of these objects survived um unlike many other uh refugees um a kind of memory culture has been sustained through uh through these 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 remnants these uh these objects these artworks these documents it's it's absolutely remarkable that they were able to Um, take them with them around you know across so many different barriers and and traumas yeah I agree with you <laughs> it's um, amazing there is a, a a fantastic question from the audience um, and Christina Bartos from Vienna now in um, Hong Kong would like to ask uh what What influence, if any, did the art and art practice of her pair of your parents have on you personally? Mm. <laughs> well, <laughs> a big question. Um, yes. Uh, when I was growing up, it was all around me. And 
I kind of just accepted it as part of my life, even though I was not inclined to be artistic myself. I was encouraged to do what I was very good at, which was the sport, and I was also a good student. But my parents never said, oh, you know, we, we're both artists. You should. On the contrary, I think they probably thought an artist's life was much too difficult, and my mother actually thought I should study medicine. But um, uh, irrespective of that, just growing up with the art all around me, it, it definitely just kind of seeped into my blood and into my being. And uh, as I had to take the responsibility, not had to, but I, it's wonderful that I had the opportunity to work with my father for, a last, for the last 11 years of, my, of his life. Unfortunately, my mother died in 1975 and I'm, I was still in the middle of having lots of my children and family and everything else. But I did immediately try and help my father as best I could to, to, could to fill the gap she had left. Well, then I, I, I had enormous insight into what was the, what the art was about, what was happening. I helped to uh, organise his exhibitions and all the other things. And that then led eventually after his death to the establishment of the museum, which is really my biggest creative contribution. Um, and uh, that's been now the focus of my life since my father died. And as I said, you, you know, the book was in gestation since my mother died, which was some 45 years or 50 years. So those things, it, it's a total influence on life. What was the name of your question? Christ, Christ, Christina Christ, Bartosz. Christina. I hope I've answered your question, Christina. She says many thanks. Um, <laughs> and uh, another question uh, that I have is whether um, your parents returned to Vienna at any point, and uh, what what, what what was that reunion, if we can call it that? What was that reunion like? Yes, I do write about that uh, in Driftwood. Um, look, it must have had so many emotional impacts on them. They only went back once as part of that one journey they did in 1968. But there were some amazing meetings there. They met up with a fellow student, Angela Stadtherr, who uh, welcomed them uh, with open arms and gave them a gift of one of her sculptures and they spent time with her. And the one little entry my mother was writing in a diary, she said, Angela Stadtherr is quite marvellous and she was already quite a well-known sculptor in Vienna. Of course, this is much later, 68. So that was a wonderful reunion. And the other strange reunion was that my father at the... Um, Academy of Fine Arts, where he'd been a student, he was walking there and he saw the name of his professor, Professor Joseph Milner, on a placard in front of a house on a, you know, marking somebody's house. And, and he knocked on the door and his old professor was still alive and welcomed him with open arms. Now, he'd never been very friendly with this professor during the time he was there. But they apparently had a wonderful meeting together, um, and uh, that was amazing as well. But uh, my mother complained. The one other little entry in her diary was that the um, the tea was served in cups and not glasses. <laughs> I thought, you know, just little things. But obviously, look, it must have been you know very difficult to walk there. I mean, I found it. I went to Vienna a couple of times for exhibitions that I organised in Vienna, and I found it difficult to walk in those streets, very difficult. Understandably. Uh, we have another question from uh, from the audience, from Dan Tawaki, and the question is, are there any artworks of Carl's in Singapore that, yes. that we could see if we visited Singapore or whoever's yes. in Singapore now? Thank you, Dan. Uh, Dan, I mentioned the Malay Boy, which is in the National Gallery in Singapore, the new National Gallery. I went to the opening of that in 2015, and they had, uh, as I mentioned, it was acquired in 2009, and they have placed it in their gallery. And I know several people who've been to the gallery since then and come back and say, oh, we saw, you know, we saw Carl Dulling's sculpture 
in the uh, Singapore National Gallery. So yes, you can see Carl Dorbig there, at least that one. But I think uh, there, there were a number that were left behind when we had to flee because we had to virtually, we were taken out of Singapore and could take hardly anything. And my father left behind a number of quite large sculptures and never found out what had happened to them. So it's quite possible that more will arise. And in fact, just the, the other day, I received back a small head that had been found in Europe um, from Singapore. And so it was returned to us in, 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 in the Dordic studio in Melbourne. So things do keep appearing. So keep your eyes out, everyone, for Carl Dordic signature on the side or underneath. We will. And, and speaking of Singapore, I actually I have um, a question and maybe a comment. The question is, uh, did your parents have any um, communication or relationship with the Baghdadi families who are already in Singapore? Um, because it, it, there was a, a, an old community there that had been Correct. there from the 18th century in the Strait Settlement. Correct. Did they Correct. have any contact with them? Yeah. Well, that's that's an interesting question. Thank you for that. Um, as you're quite correct, and I, I also uh, researched it, and there were a number of Sephardic families who were um, actually originally from Iran in Singapore, and they set up their own community there. And it was that group that actually were the Jewish community that supported the refugees who came from Europe in 1938 uh, and fled. There were uh, all together about 250 Jewish people in Singapore who had fled from Nazi Germany and Austria and landed in Singapore with, like us. And it was the Jewish community there, it's already established, that helped with support if needed and also who kind of gave us our initial notice, you know, some warning, you'd better get organised because you're going to be sent out of Singapore, the Jewish Relief Committee. Well, that was it was those people who actually helped the refugee Jews who came into Singapore. I don't know whether, but there was a, they, Elias, the Elias family. They had been in Singapore for quite a long time. And I know my father did some work for them. Now, they were well established in Singapore. So they did have contact with other established Jewish families in Singapore. But I don't have that Baghdadi family I don't have in our we have many names, but we don't that doesn't hasn't come up in my to my best of my knowledge. Might still <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, as a follow-up, uh, you mentioned that they were actually supposed to go or en route to Shanghai, or they would have had to continue to Shanghai if they didn't find a job within two weeks. How mm -hmm. did uh, within fourteen days? How did uh, how did they find? What was the first job, and how did it come about? Yes, well, um, as I mentioned, my parents had the relatives in Singapore, which was a great help for starters. But it was really just this particular job which somebody else was given and couldn't do and said, oh, Carl, you do it. And this was for the Sultan of Johor because it wasn't a typical job for a sculptor to build a cenotaph. But, of course, my father would grasp anything that came into his hands, you know, as long as he could stay there and work and show that he was working. That was the only thing that really mattered. And also they advertised really quickly in the local press uh, as art teachers, and surprisingly enough, immediately got responses. A lot of people wanted to learn art uh, from academically trained European artists, and they had quite a following there as art teachers as well. This is absolutely fascinating, this part also of the journey, this kind of transfer, if you will, of uh, modernist Viennese education to Singapore. And would you know uh, if uh, any of their lesson plans remain or any of the kind of um, prompts that they gave their students remain? Nothing of that except John Eber, who was one of their students, um, and Situ Chi. Actually, yes, you're right. Thank you for that question. Uh, Situ Chi, he was a Chinese who was introduced to Carl 
as a young man. He was 19 at the time, and his relative was a, a Situ Kwai or other artists in Singapore. They all knew each other, these artists. And they, this young man came to study art with my father, and he took that wonderful photo with Yuta Fu and the Buddhist priest and me and dad. And um, he, and there's a photo of him in our collection as well, he became one of the leading sculptors in China. Now, we don't have his work per se or his um, actual, what, what my father was teaching him, but one of John Eber's letters to my father, he was a solicitor in, in Singapore who helped us and who also tried to get permission for us to stay there. Uh, he, one of his letters to my parents in Tatura actually said that uh, it's got a drawing on it which had been cut out by the censors. So, and it said that uh, they were still working in the mode, in the way my father had taught them. So I don't know what ways they were because there's no record of that. But, I mean, most of it's practical anyway. And you sort of, you know, it's hands-on. So you do it as you go. And uh, speaking of John Eber, from what I understand, he sent uh, clay to your yes. father in Tatura. <laughs> Is that right? How did yes. that come about that he was able to send clay to an internment camp in Victoria, in the middle of nowhere. Well, who would have thought anyone would want to receive clay or that clay would go by mail from one country to another? I mean, you know, it's really quite strange altogether. But there is this one head in the collection, which is certainly made in Tatura. It's signed underneath Tatura 1941. But the clay is not a local clay. It is definitely a Singapore clay. And uh, when my father was working there, he used to work, get the clay from what a company called the Alexandra Brickworks. And this clay was probably sourced from the brickworks and sent by John Eber to my father in the internment camp in Chatura. And I still have to laugh when I think about what the mailman and what the censors must have thought about this parcel as it arrived in uh, you know, what's inside it? Has it got a bomb in it or something like that? <laughs> Absolutely incredible, actually, yeah. that it got past the censors. <laughs> yes, amazing, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, your earliest memories are from where, if I may ask you? Ah, yes, my earliest memories are in the camp, uh, in Tortura. I must have been about four, and I do remember sitting with my father and looking at the wonderful night sky and this mesmerizing scene of these stars in this blacked out scene because uh, the camps were blacked out in case of bombs and things some of the time. And uh, just to watch the stars in that setting was just amazing. And also playing with my little friends. I have little things, snippets of memories that come back of playing with my other little toddlers. We were all, there quite a number of us, the same age, and it was great fun, and I do remember some of that. They were one of my first memories. From what I understand, uh, Camp 3 in Tatura had Germans, Austrians, German Jews, uh, basically everyone who was an enemy alien from Central Europe was in that in, in Camp 3. Was there any kind of relationship between the Jews and the non-Jews? Okay. We were in Camp 3D, I think. I have to look, look that up again. But we were the family camp. And at first there were some Nazi sympathizers with us because we were all in turn as German enemy aliens. But And some of those people were actually Nazi sympathizers. However, there was a, a bit of a riot that occurred in the camp at one point, and those Nazi sympathizers were moved out of our camp altogether. Mm -hmm. Adjacent to us were the, the people from the Denira, which is a ship that had come from Great Britain, and most of those were Jewish refugees, not all, but most of them were. And then there were two other camps camps adjacent to us. All of these camps, you know, had communication through corridors. Well, the corridors were between us, but you could sort of see into them. And as I mentioned, there was a riot because at one point 
uh, the camp inmates of one of those camps who were pro-Nazi began to bait the Jewish internees with Nazi slogans, Nazi songs, and march up and down the corridors on the other side of the barbed wire. And that created so much of a skirmish that actually shots were fired in the air by the guard. Mm. And that was an incident that is recorded in the archive, in the Australian archives. And I've just written it into a document, into a, an article I've written for a new book which is coming out on statelessness being published actually in Shanghai. Oh, fantastic. We look forward to that. When is that coming out? Um, I was told in 1925 now. Oh, okay, 2025. Great. Yeah. <laughs> we look forward to that. There is another question uh, to you, which is how did your father's Jewish identity and the experience of escaping to Singapore impact his art? Hmm. Um, I had a re in my original set of slides, there were a lot, there was a lot more art in it, but I decided to cut the slides down a bit because I didn't want the talk to go on too long and I wanted to focus on the story more. However, those are works of art which I have had deleted from my slide, the original slideshow, were principally monuments or um, commemorative works to the Holocaust in one way or another. Now, these were commissions my father was asked to complete, um, ones in stained glass, ones in bronze. Um, then there are, uh, there's a uh, wonderful um, commemorative work to Raoul Wallenberg, and there, there are other commemorative works that he completed here. The, as I said, they were commissioned works. Given a commission where he had thought about the situation of his own family and and the wonderful figure of dawn in Israel and so on, that's again a Holocaust work. Then I'm sure then his Jewish feelings are certainly imbued in those works. And as you saw, the, I also showed the figure of Moses. Now. That biblical subject was very strong in his mind, as was the subject of Adam and Eve. But that's not necessarily because he's Jewish. That's because he saw these as particular important um, points in history or in life that he could use as his way of expressing himself. He also did a wonderful take on the portrait of Nofretiti, the Egyptian queen. Uh, now, that's not a Jewish subject by any means, but he always said to me, look, I think that the Jews built the pyramids, you know, and the Jews may have been the sculptors of the wonderful Egyptian sculptures, which we still admire. Who knows? We don't know. Um, it, it is, he always said he's an artist. He is Jewish by religion, but he's an artist. It's, a, it's not an easy thing. It's not as if, you know, he would uh, sort of um, lo look to his religion for inspiration, but the religion was always there. I don't know whether I've kind of explained that well enough, but I hope I have. Uh, thank you. It's a difficult question. <laughs> a difficult question indeed. I think what's interesting also that you alluded to uh, or that you actually stated is the support and the commissions from the Jewish community in Melbourne uh, after the war, right? And from what it sounds like, there was a lot of initiative and a great deal of um, collaboration between different uh, artists, who Jewish artists who came at different time, who were exiles in a way, exiles in Melbourne. What yes. was that relationship like within the exile community, also in terms of people who came at different moments and Thank how they you. with different styles, with different artistic styles, some from Berlin, some from Vienna? What was yes. that like? Yeah, Thank you so much for that question. Uh, first of all, my father and a group of friends started a Jewish artist society in Melbourne and therefore they all became much closer to each other. Um, as you've mentioned, there were Jewish architects who commissioned Jewish sculptors, who commissioned Jewish 
craftsmen and there's one particular room which we actually use as a an example of how these people collaborated um, the the room was designed by Ernst Fuchs and uh, an architect from Vienna he commissioned my father to do a wall relief which covers the whole large wall of this room and he commissioned Schulen Krimper a craftsman to do the sideboard, the internal timber sideboard and decor for this particular room. And then the photograph of this, which is in the National Archives and in National and um, State Library of Victoria, was taken by a German uh, emigre Wolfgang Sievers. So they all knew each other. And um, the photographer from my father's first book, Karl Dordick Sculpture, Mark um, Strizik is also a refugee. So these, these people who came from Europe after the war, by no means all of them Jewish, a few Jews and many others, they enriched society here enormously, all of them. And uh, the, this country owes a great deal to the culture that was brought to it post-war. It's a fascinating story of Melbourne modernism and uh, mm -hmm. kind of transfer, but also adaptation, adaptation of certain ways of working and motifs to the new landscape and mm -hmm. to the new climate. Um, but the cakes remained, right? The cakes on Ackland Street remained. <laughs> <laughs> Until now. Until um, now. Yes, uh, it's not as good anymore. <laughs> Um, yes, there were Ackland Street and St Kilda where we first lived when we first moved into our own flat in Melbourne was in Ackland Street, St Kilda. And down the road was what was called the Village Bell, which consisted of a whole group of lovely, small, intimate shops, uh, priesters, the grocer, uh, the chemist who was Spiegelmann. I remember all the names because we used to go there all the time. Monarch, the cake shop, um, uh, all kinds of small other delicatessens and eateries. And it was like a mini kind of um, oh, Eastern Europe, or not Eastern Europe, Central Europe, where the refugees could gather. And they did right up until oh, almost into, into this century, I think. It's changed a lot now. Though. And uh, then you. there was the Cafe Scheherazade there for a while too, which some of you will have heard of. Yes, I was going to ask you whether yeah. your parents were part of that circle, the Scheherazade yeah, circle. That's right. My father did um, drew there constantly. He went there to eat, and he, he knew Masha and Amram very well, and so did I. And uh, he used to draw. He used to go there for his you know, lunch or whatever, and while he was there, he'd pick up a napkin and he'd draw you sitting opposite, you know, and he'd do a little sketch. And those sketches are in our museum now, but they were also on display till the till the restaurant closed about 20 years ago. And they were on display on the walls. Mm. Thank you. Um, one more question has just come in. We, uh, your story is uh, evoking all kinds of memories and uh, thoughts. And the question is, do you have a special love or memory of Vienna? Myself? <laughs> yes. Do you have a special love or memory of Vienna? Uh, this person notes that there may be Viennese afternoon tea served for visitors of ah, your studio in Melbourne. Correct. Yes, the food. <laughs> yes. I, I was thinking about that today, actually. I think I've retained quite a bit of the kind of Viennese background through my parents, uh, through the food, through just some of the habits, some of the cultural things, some of the ideas about fashion. My mother was so conscious of fashion and she used to design the clothes I wore and all of those things. And there is definitely something in there in me. Um, that doesn't mean I have an absolute effect. I, and have a sort of nostalgic affection in a way, but it's a two-way affection. Uh, but the culture, I, I think I do, yes, 
I, I certainly kept quite a bit of that. And I love Maril and Kurdel, and I love uh, Search and Kuchen, and I love uh, other Viennese delicacies that my mother used to make. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> Did your parents ever consider going back, or was that a kind of rupture? No, no, we... no, no. <laughs> no, definitely not to Europe. The only thought my father had, because it was quite frustrating here as a sculptor in particular, to build up any kind of um, reputation and to become in any sense significant here was very difficult to get commissions, was difficult. And at times my father used to say, we should move to America. And mm -hmm. I can remember the discussions with my mother about that when I was growing up. But, of course, coming through the traumas and the dramas and the re-establishment, they came here in midlife. You know, they were 40. There was really no way that they could uproot themselves again and move again, and certainly not back to Europe. And when you moved to the Netherlands for... Uh, what was... Uh, can you tell us about that decision? <laughs> this also ties in with your story. Uh, oh, what dear. was that like as a decision? Was it a family decision uh, when you went to, uh, to <laughs> back to Europe? That was a romance. <laughs> <laughs> I met my husband in the Middle East uh, in um, the Six Maccabi Games in Israel in 1961. We decided to get... He was Dutch and I was Australian. And uh, in five days, we decided we would get married. And um, six months later, Hari, Hari de Jong, my husband, came to Melbourne and we married in Melbourne and I went back with him to live in Holland for three years and our first child, Tanya, was born there and then we moved back to Melbourne and Anthony and Peter were born here. So that was um, not uh, a decision. It was kind of a happening in my life and it took me back to Europe uh, which was amazing, really, quite amazing to live there for a while. And was that your first uh, meeting then with Rella? No, um, yes, uh, 1961, correct. That The first meeting with Rella was when I went to Wimbledon in 1961. That was before Early. I met my husband, one year earlier, well, one few months earlier, and uh, that's when I discovered the cases of sculpture underneath, underneath her apartment. Thank you. And maybe we should, you know, mention this book once again, Driftwood, because also the way that you wrote it is really an interesting work of memory. Uh, every chapter starts with your own memories, actually, or with your voice and intervention um, from the present right, from the present. And I think that's that's interesting because you're telling your parents' story, but it's also very much bringing all of this legacy and this life um, to a contemporary memory culture. Can you just tell us about that decision and the way you wrote this uh, <laughs> this book? Oh, it was so, as I said, it was so difficult to decide how to do it and what voice to use and what technique to use to keep the audience engaged. And uh, then I read The Hair with the Amber Eyes by um, uh, the Dutch author, wonderful, wonderful book. And he uses the late motif of the Netsuki, mm, those right. of you who've read it. And I found that quite fascinating how that little piece that he has in his pocket travels through every chapter almost of this book. And I thought, oh, you know what? We have a museum in which there are countless items of works of art. Each one of them tells the story. And if I use one of those, just one, and it'll tell the story about that particular period. Or if I use an incident when my mother wanted to buy a jinka, you know, that will tell the story of her background. So I use these little things as the kind of leitmotif, the starting point, the trigger, if you like, for the chapter. But it's still, it's 
it's not completely chronological, but it runs in a chronological form. Um, then uh, the other thing, as you rightly mentioned, know it, is that I do have inserted in there incidents of when I went to Europe, uh, particularly in just before the late 1990s, and I went back to Pianethil and I saw the house myself and I write about that. Mm. And I write about going to Vienna and going into the house where my father lived and climbing those stairs and I write about that and I write about other incidents such as in the camp in Tatura when I returned after 50 years and what that felt like. So there are these insertions which are from the present, yes, right. Yeah, so you've been very good. Thank you so much, Norit. I really you're enjoyed that. Wonderful, wonderful uh, to answer those questions and to have those questions asked. Thank you so much for that. My pleasure. And Let me end now. I believe we've kept you online now for two full, two and a half full hours. Oh, and it's quite, quite late in Melbourne. Um, so thank you very, very much. Congratulations, Eva. Eva, excuse me, I keep... That's I keep all right. The German pronunciation. <laughs> Congratulations, Eva, on founding the museum, on preserving and conserving the art, the artifacts, the story uh, for others to explore. I'm reading here from Gina Panabianco. This is her comment to you. This is her congratulations to you um, for this inspiration. Thank you, Gina. <laughs> and uh, as we uh, end this uh, talk with you today, uh, I'd like to encourage everyone to visit the Duldig Studio Museum and Sculpture Garden in Melbourne. Uh, take that trip, go to Mel East Melbourne, meet Eva when you can. Uh, it's, it's an exceptional, exceptional experience and an exceptional space. Um, and as a note to those who are based in Hong Kong, uh, I would like to just announce that uh, we will be hosting our annual uh, Yom HaShoah on Monday, May 6th, uh, annual Yom HaShoah event on Monday, May 6th. So please stay tuned on the Hong Kong Holocaust uh, Intolerance Center's mm -hmm. website and also through our mailing list. Uh, I'd like to once again thank everyone who has joined us today from all over the world. This is really about the kind of driftwood that has gathered here tonight. Um, and thank you to everyone uh, who asked questions. And thank you also to the Fritz, uh, uh, Fritz Asher Society uh, for um, supporting us tonight. But the biggest thanks goes to Eva de Jong Duldig for this remarkable story and this remarkable life.